I hope you will look differently at, at crows in the future after hearing this talk. Um, it is great to speak in front of such a distinguished and interdisciplinary audience, but admittedly I'm a little bit uneasy because I'm not sure whether my brain, um, I can trust my brain entirely today. As you can see, I'm working on a long-term project um, and researchers have recently found out that women suffer impaired cognition uh, cognitive functioning in the last two months of their pregnancies, and also it's true that the brain is actually shrinking. <laughs> so if I won't be brilliant, please excuse me. But I'm going to talk today about even smaller brains um, than human brains, bird brains. The, the brain of a crow is of the size of a walnut, yet when corrected for body size, it is as large as those of, a gra of the great apes. Um, our closest relatives. I'm going to tell you today about the field of animal cognition and take you on a tour into the avian mind based on the new scientific discoveries. Let me briefly start describing you the field. Comparative cognition aims at unfolding the cognitive processes underlying complex, co uh, complex behavior and their evolution. Um, the central motivation of the field is to find, uh, is to understand the evolution of the brain, of the human brain and mind and intelligence in general. We see the mind as an outcome of evolution and study the cognitive ab abilities as evolutionary adaptations to the ecological and social environment. Everybody familiar with evolutionary theory knows that selection pressures act on morphology, resulting in virtually perfect um, adaptations to, of the body to the environment. Of course, the same principle also applies to the mind. Well, maybe to your surprise, scientists only began studying the mental abilities of our closest relatives um, seriously from the 1960s onwards. Before that, animals were, were, were seen as instinct-governed or programmed machines, and it, it was a scientific taboo to think they may have mental processes. Only in the late 1990s did one gradually begin um, to study intelligent animals other than primates, for example, elephants, dolphins, dogs, and during the last 10 years, also the crow family, which have quickly moved into the scientific spotlight, as you will see. Maybe you're not aware of this because you saw animals doing amazing tricks in the circles or on television, but um, you have to keep in mind here that these animals have most of the time lab been laboriously trained to do these things and certainly not um, about intelligence and innovation. Um, you can even train a cockroach to do amazing things. <laughs> um, our field um, changed the view, our view of the world within a very short time. There's sound scientific evidence today that many mental capacities that have been considered to be uniquely human are shared by apes. Hardly surprising, give, hardly surprising Given that they are our closest relatives, we share our last common ancestors um, six million years ago, and that they, their um, DNA is 98% of their DNA is identical to ours. But you might be surprised that to hear that this is not only restricted to our closest relatives, but also, um, but. Um, these formerly unique human mental capacities have also been demonstrated in the crow family. Even though our ancestors split 310 million years ago, in evolutionary terms, one me uh, this means that they, have, they must have experienced similar selection pressures. In fact, throughout the last 10 years, we have shown that Corbett's parallel apes in, in, almost, in cognitive performance in almost all aspects of complex cognition um, that have been tested to date. Just to highlight some examples, they exhibit theory of mind 
that's a very human trait, which means reasoning about others as intentional agents with perceptions, intentions, and knowledge. We have evidence today that Corvids can take the visual perspective of their peers and understand what others know or don't know. And as a consequence, they may inform or misinform others by the use of communicative gestures. Corvids also show mental time travel. And until a long time ago, it was, it was commonly assumed that animals were stuck in time and not aware of the past or the future. Recent research indicates that Corvids do remember specific events they have individually experienced in the past. For example, scrub jays, a member of the crow family that relies on caching food and protecting their food caches against conspecific pilferers, um, they rem remember exactly um, who watched them when they were hiding what, where, and when. That's called episodic-like memory in, in humans. They also have be, um, been shown to imagine potential scenarios in the future and plan ahead accordingly. For example, um, they, they, um, in carefully controlled experiments, they hide food where they will have it in the future and distinguish between different food types they had in different places. They also show, Corvids also show self-recognition. Um, they pass the famous mirror mark test, which is a benchmark paradigm in, in developmental psychology. Um, and here a mark is placed on a body part that, is not, uh, that cannot be seen without a mirror. And one tests whether the child or the animal can um, show self-inspection behaviors towards its own body, directed towards the mark, but not towards the mirror. And little children can only do that when they're about 11 months old. And um, in chimpanzees, 100 individuals have been tested and only five could do it. And there's even weaker evidence in, in dolphins and elephants. Um, Corvids also show tool use, especially the New Caledonian crows, which is uh, one of my focal study subjects. It is considered to be the most sophisticated uh, habitual animal tool user and manufacturer in the, uh, together with chimpanzees. This is striking because tool use is considered to, um, to be linked with enhanced com cognitive uh, enhanced complex cognition. Tool use was also once part of the definition of mankind, and until it was discovered in chimpanzees by Jane Goodall. And anthropologists regard tool use as one of the drivers of the sudden expansion of, our brain, of the brains of our ancestors. Tool use, and even more so tool making, are exceedingly rare in, in, in animals and usually extremely primitive, except for New Caledonian crows and chimpanzees. Particularly, um, this list of sophisticated mental abilities in crows could be continued for a long time, but for the remaining minutes, I would like to focus um, on a a particularly puzzling aspect of their cognitive ability, namely the ability to solve novel problems innovatively and flexibly, and, re and respond to novel situations flexibly. Particularly, um, particularly interesting as uh, cases of large-brained uh, large animals solving a novel problem all of a sudden, hence displaying an innovation completely spontaneously. This is an intriguing phenomenon one refers to as insight in psychology, and we are trying to understand it better. I will now present you with some interesting and relatively recent um, findings from our research group. To make it particularly difficult, we test, uh, we confront our birds with novel problems that involve the use or the manufacture of novel tools. Um, that means for the habitually using New Caledonian crows that we um, test them with tools they're not um, using in the wild or, and that they have no experience with. For non-tool using corvids and parrots, um, tool use is per definition innovative because they don't use them habitually in, in the wild. Um, we test 
We test whether they can flexibly modify their tools according to functionality, whether they can use or make novel tools in a new context, hence invent tools, and whether they can come up with novel te techniques for making new tools. Um, first of all, um, I will present you one of the best experiments to date that animals reason about cause and effect and require knowledge about the underlying mechanism before they can suddenly solve a novel problem. At the same time, this experiment is about innovative tool use because New Caledonian crows do not normally use stones as tools. Here we present the birds um, with a novel physical problem, food on a platform in a transparent, um, sorry, food on a platform um, in a transparent box with a tube on top of it. And unless you know that this platform um, can collapse, um, you will accept that the food cannot be accessed because it's resting on a platform out of reach. Of course, we humans might infer by seeing the hinges and the, and the magnets uh, holding the platform up, we can infer what to do, but if you are naive about that, you cannot possibly infer what to do. And therefore, we predicted that our test birds would not be able to solve this task um, without any knowledge. And in fact, neither New Caledonian crows nor non-tool using jackdaws solved this task when they were exposed to this apparatus in stones. However, um, we then um, split the birds into different groups that were allowed to learn different aspects of the problem they had faced. So one group was trained to nudge stones from the rim of the tube in, into the, and collapse the platform and get the food. So they learned that stones were important for solving it, the task. Another group learned indirectly about the mechanism of the task, about the co collapsibility of the platform by pushing it down directly with their beak. So they did not learn anything about stones. And another group, uh, they learned that, um, the about the collapsibility of the platform if pressure is exerted over it. Um, a third group learned in their also indirectly about just the collapsibility of the, the platform by being trained to pull a string attached to the platform from underneath. So um, they also learned about force having to be exerted on the platform, but in the opposite direction because they had to pull instead of push. Um, and again, they were note here that their action was not directed towards the mouth of the tube, and, it, um, and they were not rewarded for using, touching stones. Um, now, please guess which groups could solve the original task when they were exposed to it again. Well, um, not surprisingly, the group that was uh, trained to nudge stones succeeded because they, all they had to do is to transfer, that they had to pick up stones, carrying them through the apparatus and, and put them into the tube. They succeeded, but also group two and three that had only indirectly learned about the mechanism without ever being rewarded to touch stones, suddenly picked them up and used them as novel tools to collapse the platform. This is particularly remarkable in, in the group that was trained with strings because they had never directed any attention towards the mouth of the tube before, and they had to infer from pulling that exerting force on the platform yielded an equivalent effect. From this, we can conclude that crows were reasoning about the causal and mechanistic structure of the problem, about physical forces, gravity and pressure, and flexibly put the two into relation to suddenly come up with a solution. Interesting, too, was also that no, uh, not a single jackdaw, a non-tool using crow, could solve that, um, that problem even when they were extensively trained with stones. They all failed, so it's really a, a difficult pr um, problem for birds to solve. Now, I will briefly run you through some other experiments. The first... Ah, I wanted to show you how it looks like. That is when, when she first... Uh, it's one in, um, example of training to indirectly learn about the mechanism. And then you will see the first test where she actually succeeds. 
This is the very first test after this experience. She's frustrated because she can't access, she can't reach the platform anymore. <laughs> they have very funny voices. Can also learn to speak. And then she does it. And she, they don't do that normally. So it's really amazing. Um, <laughs> thank you. And here, uh, we have the next case, I should actually stop, um, the, the first case of creativity in a bird stemmed from our now famous New Caledonian crow, Betty, who spontaneously fashioned a hook tool out of a piece of wire, which resulted in a science paper. This was actually a chance observation when uh, testing something completely different. The experiment was about tool selectivity and, and testing whether New Caledonian crows have some functional understanding and can choose the appropriate a tool of appropriate shapes for the appropriate task. And then it happened that Betty's partner, Nalik, stole her hook tool she needed to solve the task. And then she surprised us and the world by just reshaping the straight wire. And that's, that's um, when she's doing it. Well, exactly, Here's, she's trying with a non-functional tool. And there's a little bucket in that tube, and she can't pull it up without a hook. It's getting really cross. And now she's playing around with it, you have to be, pay attention. Here she's bending the wire into a hook. Be careful. A little bit difficult to see because it's a scientific movie. They're bad quality usually. <laughs> and she has it now. She did it now. Um, of course, the, the, um, thereafter, we replicated this experiment with several other birds and under completely controlled conditions, that means without partners that could steal things, and tested whether the birds could not only bend a tool when a hook was necessary, but also unbend a tool when they needed a straight one. For this apparatus, you need a straight one to push food out of these channels. Um, and I will show you the videos now and, and to see, show you how the birds performed. This is another case of bending. You see the non-functional but modifiable straight tools here on the corner. And he, uh, he's, he is using a completely different technique than the other bird because he's turning the tool around and bending it directly with his beak, not by pushing it against something, and then he's pulling it out, and it's quite difficult to pull the food out of that tree trunk. But he succeeds. And here's the same with um, straightening. This is Betty's daughter. She's equally clever. Here, they only have hook tools. And you have to watch carefully. It's not so easy to see, but she also uses her beak to unbend the tool. And once more, then it's straight. She turns it around and uses it. Quite difficult for them to handle <laughs> such long tools. There she's, she goes. <laughs> it would be so nice if the birds could hear your applause. <laughs> um, okay, then we recently we observed an even more astonishing finding of a cockatoo hence a bird that does not normally use um, to any tools in the wild. The bird called Figaro um, spontaneously used, but to our astonishment, also made reaching tools 
spontaneously when objects of food were out of his reach. He not only went searching for stick tools, but started to cut long, appropriately sized splinters out of the wooden beam of his aviary. As you can see here, really complicated procedure, and he did that spontaneously. Um, and he also cut twigs out of a branch and used it to reach it as rake to, for reaching food out, of, uh, food out of his reach. Figaro shows us that even when non-tool users, members of a species that are good problems, curious, good problem solvers and um, large brains, can sculpt tools out of a shapeless source material to fulfill a novel need. Um, as a last example, I'm going to show you a study about innovative tool making in New Caledonian Crows, just finished two weeks ago, where we show the first case of additive tool making outside the great apes. Making tools out of different parts is considered very sophisticated and, and that appears only late in the evolution of tools in, in man. So, um, New Caledonian crows, um, I, I go back, the, uh, New Caledonian crows did spontaneously make such tools by combining two short tools to create a long reaching tool. They flexibly used different materials we offered them and they only combined tools when it was really necessary, when they really needed a long tool, indicating that they understood that they acted in a goal-directed manner. And it's going very fast. It was actually looking quite simple, but it's something spectacular. Um, let's see. This is the apparatus that uh, there is food in here. But it's already done. <laughs> it was very quick. Um, well, compared to the only chimpanzees who solved this task under controlled experimental settings um, and took over two hours, our birds took in between eight minutes and, and 40 minutes. In conclusion, I hope that your perception of crows and bird brains may have changed and that you're convinced that animals can do more than we thought. Thank you very much for your attention.